So a warm welcome to our friends and colleagues from around the world. It's really great to have you here to uh, hear about the Global Grass-Fed Alliance, uh, and really our first uh, public event. Of course, many of us are used to being huddled in the Oxford Town Hall in England at this time of year, but COVID has actually brought us an opportunity to reach out and connect internationally online. So my sincere thanks to the Oxford Real Farming Conference for providing us with a platform for this session, which is kindly hosted by the Pasture-Fed Livestock Association that works in the UK and Ireland to champion grass-fed livestock farming through its Pasture for Life certification mark. So the format for today is that we will be hearing from three speakers, three organisations, uh, members of the Global Grass-Fed Alliance from around the world, and then we'll quickly get into discussion uh, and be looking forward to hearing your questions. We'll also be following this session in an hour's time with a Zoom breakout where we can continue to the dialogue with you and very much look forward to that. Russ, I'm so sorry. It looks like Crowdcast might be having an issue and it's and it still has not started. Give me one moment. Let me just fix this. I'll stay okay. on here until until we've got a confirmation that's working. Really okay. apologize for this. Um, one second. It looks like it actually just caught up. So let me just make sure it didn't cut anything off. Thanks for your patience. My introduction will be well rehearsed tonight. Yeah, I, it might have <laughs> caught it, but it's, oh, no, it actually is good. So, yeah, you're good. Keep going. Start from the top? Nope, um, it actually caught everything. It just took a second to catch up. So, okay. yeah, you should be good. Perhaps I could have my slides up now. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, um, for bearing with us with the technology. So um, as some of you all know, I've been involved with in, in establishing the Pasture-Fed Livestock Association in the UK. And those of us that were involved in leading this organization uh, from the very beginning, creating a new movement uh, defined by a new model of ruminant meat and milk production. We often found it to be a lonely place. So it was very pleasing to begin making contact with other kindred spirits around the globe and in particular thanks must go to the American Grass-Fed Association who in those early years really helped us to get started and showed us just what could be done. Since then more and more organizations and groups of farmers have been begun popping up and so in 2016 at Slow Foods Terra Madre event in Turin, Italy we assembled a small group of us to meet and share our stories as shown in this photo here with friends from South Africa, America, Italy, and Switzerland present. And since as the world has become a smaller place and this has enabled us to gain momentum and the pandemic has actually provided us with an incentive to come together on Zoom and build a bigger network for collaboration and best practice sharing. There's now 31 individual individuals and organizations forming the alliance working across 21 countries and here shown are some of their labels and logos working with grass-fed livestock today we'll hear from three of these member organizations as examples of some of the initiatives and labels involved and be discussing together and with you how we can establish credibility and consistency for grass-fed produce around the world without further ado i would like to hand over so my good friend, Carrie, who is the Executive De Director of the American Grass-Fed Association. Over to you, Carrie. Have we still got Carrie? Has she left us? Yeah, I'm here. Where she is. Over to you, Carrie. Good morning, everybody, or afternoon, or wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much, Russ, and everybody on the call. Um, it's been really exciting to watch this thing um, morph into something, um, uh, a global um, um, concern about the labeling of grass-fed in, the, in the, the world, because everybody, now that all of a sudden people are excited about eating more uh, holistically and um, uh, nutritionally, so we're we're working together um, to make sure that p 
people who are actually doing the work get the premium for the work that they're doing. I've got a few slides that I'll share with you. Let me make sure I can do that. <laughs> there, can you, everybody see that? Anyway, just a little overview of what uh, the American. You know, Carrie, we need you to um, to actually share the uh, your slides right now. It looks like you're sharing the uh, the the browser that you're in. So, if you uh, if you stop sharing, do you have your slides in PowerPoint? No, I have them in PDF. Okay, so if you stop sharing what you're sharing right now and go back mm -hmm. down to share screen, okay, um, then go over to application window. Um, you should see a, a little a little icon of your PDF, and so you can share that. Okay, here we go. Is this it? Um, one second. Let me add it up. Yep, that's the one. Thank you. Let me go back. Anyway, the American Grass Fed Association started in 2003 when the um, labeling concern said that they were going to allow grass-fed labels when you could feed 20% grain, confine, give antibiotics and hormones, and call it grass-fed. So we started working with, uh, with USDA to come up with a meaningful label at that time. So this was in 2003, and we worked with the USDA to try and make it a meaningful claim until 2007 when the USDA decided to only um, make the label what the animal ate, not where or how or anything else. So we decided to do our own third party certification. Um, we were the first um, uh, third party grass fed certification in the US and, and I think in the world, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lay claim to that one until I know for sure. Um, but we only certify in the United States so when, when others started reaching out to us, we decided that, that we were going to um, not try and institutionalize and industrialize what we were doing um, and let other countries who had different uh, uh, farming schemes and, and everything else have, we're going to have a basic set, uh, set of tenants. So this is our mission from the farm to the marketplace. And you can read these and these, these slides will be available to you. Um, but we have a national standard for ruminants, for pork, and for dairy at this time. And we spend a lot of time working with consumers to make them understand the difference between what people say is grass-fed and what is truly pastured animals and, and what that means. So these are our, our areas of, of, of concern, 100% grass or forage-based diet, always raised on pasture without confinement, no antibiotics and hormones. And that does not mean that if you have an animal who needs to be treated, that you do not treat them, you treat them, but you take them out of the program. Um, and that was uh, something that was very important to us. And um, it was for the consumer because they, they weren't understanding how that, how we were not, we were not, we weren't, we we're allowing antibiotics. So, and then, um, American family farms and farmers. The animals have to be born and raised on American family farms. They, uh, we, don't, we don't do any certification outside the United States. So then again, um, we do, we do our, our on-farm inspections at least every 15 months. Um, the, and then once they're inspected, then they can use our logo trademark and on their marketing materials and websites. The reason we do every 15 months instead of every 12 is so that we can see the farms at different times of the, of the year. Um, this is just the steps. And again, these slides will be available for you. Um, and it's a really simple process. We kept it as simple as, pos as possible. Our standards and our programs and our organization is run by producers. So that makes it very simple. So once we, the producers say that we can do this or we can do that, then we get together with the scientists and nutritionists and, and the other folks and make it a, a, a workable um, program for small, we started with very small farms and farmers and we wanna keep it so that the very small farmers can be part of our program because that's that keeps rural America uh, alive and thriving. Um, we go to conferences. I had the wonderful opportunity to go to Oxford a few years ago when we were still traveling and we do field days. We do networking. We have a big conference every year where we partner with uh, a Quivira coalition, which is a wonderful organization with a lot, a lot of really young uh, up and coming farmers and then also holistic management international. So it's, it's a really good time. Plus we, we support a lot of other, other organizations and, and their conferences. This is how we educate consumers. This is just a few of the folks that we work with. Um, 
there's lots more. Anytime that we have a, a chance to reach out to consumers, we do that. And we have a new marketing director who is busily uh, creating um, content for consumers. Um, this is, uh, again, creating the community in the United States and so that we are, we're, we're relevant. Uh, we just started a wonderful program where we, we highlight our producers and we do a 20 to 30 minute podcast with them. And we're very pleased with the way that that's, that's growing. So we want, we want to talk about the farmers. Um, we help with supply chains. We get a lot of calls and, and requests for people, uh, suppliers who are looking for true authentic grass fed in the United States. So we, we have a marketplace on our website where everybody can kind of connect and, and go back and forth with that. <clears throat> These are some of the people that we collaborate with. Um, HMI, Natural Resource, you can read through all of these again too. Uh, there's a lot of folks and a lot of content that needs to be gone through today. So, um, But we advocate. The other thing that we're doing, um, and it's something that was very important, and it's something that is still very important for us, is that uh, we're starting to do a lot of policy and advocacy work with the government and other organizations. We work with Family Farm Alliance. Uh, we're working with the Federal Trade Commission to try and stop with some mislabeling issues and other things. So um, we work with, with several organizations that are really working on it. So we're educating the consumers how proper use of land for grazing and the proper care of grazing animals can benefit the land and the environment, providing markets for products for these re responsible land stewards. Now, we, we are always going back to the land but we've just started a webinar series on holistic animal health as well. So we're going to, we're going to take the whole thing through the cycle of the land back to the animal. And we're very pleased about that. So we have, uh, we have over 20,000 people who, who sign on for our, our updates on advocacy. And um, this is how to reach us. And if you look at this wonderful gentleman in his tractor there, that's uh Pettit Farms, and that's his grandson going with him. So it's another generation coming up. But uh, again, thank you. And I don't want to take up all the time. I want these other wonderful voices to have a chance and for you all to have a chance to ask us questions. So I'm going to quit the slides right now and let um, Russ introduce the next person. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carrie. That's a really wonderful overview of the American Grass Fed Association. And uh, you're providing such a fantastic example to the rest of us around the world in, in what you've done and developed. But we'll hear more a little later. So next I'd like to introduce Anna Jameson from Sweden. Uh, she's in charge of an organisation called Pasture Beef and Lamb. And here she is. And we've met only in the last 12 months online through working together on a European focus group for sustainable beef production. So delighted to connect with Anna. And over to you, Anna, to tell us all about what you're up to in Sweden. Thank you. Thanks, Russ, and thanks everybody for um, listening to us and, and watching us as well. Uh, my name is Anna Jameson, and I um, I am a true blue Swede, but I happen to marry and, and import a an, uh, British guy, so that's the connection to the name. I work with uh, something that I felt I needed pictures to, to explain and show you, so here I hope are my slides, and I'll get to the beginning. Um, we in the Swedish Pasture Beef and Lamb Association, we are completely uh, passionate about this kind of land. And we, we have many similarities to, to the other organizations in the Alliance, but I sometimes feel that we come from a slightly different angle because for us, it's actually the land that is prior number one and the animals for us is a way of looking after this kind of land so I'd like to explain that a little bit too but I, I'd also like to say that I was so pleased when I met Russ uh, online and we started talking and he he, he told us about the alliance because we have felt very lonely we've worked with this topic for about 30 years now and I had no idea before that there were so many other organizations out there. And I feel, like Carrie said, that we can become really strong now when the world is beginning to wake up to what we are doing. So uh, to explain a little bit about Sweden, who I know not very many people know so much about and have maybe haven't visited, 
our country is 70% forest and a lot of lakes also. So there isn't a whole lot of agricultural land to begin with. Um, apart from the, the forest, there's also like 8% of uh, arable crops and intensive grasslands. So uh, when you've taken all that and the cities and the roads away, you, uh, there isn't so all that much pasture, um, the, the stuff I work with, left. And in fact, it used to be, of course, a lot more. They used to, a lot of what is forest today used to be these semi-natural pastures. And on the pictures here, you can see some of the types of uh, semi-natural pastures that we try to preserve. Um, it's the land that's between water and uh, arable land. It's between forest and arable land. Um, and we have a lot of water. We have a lot of coastline. I'm sorry for the messy picture of, of Sweden, but I did as best as I can. Now, 30 years ago, WWF Sweden realized that what used to be one and a half to two million semi-natural pastures, hectares, semi-natural pastures in Sweden were diminishing and becoming less and less. And we're now down to about 450,000 hectares, just 1% of the land's surface. Um, and they realized that this was a, a, a catastrophe for birds, for insects, for all sorts of small mammals, uh, and also, uh, of course, for the grazing um, animals that were used to be kept on this land. The land was f formed by man and an animal together as a way of keeping actually the animals alive without having to use good arable land to feed them. So, so animals used to graze in the forest and they grazed along the lakes and they grazed everywhere where you couldn't grow other crops. Um, so, so that's an important difference for us. So WWF started trying to, to, to work with farmers and to get this, um, to, to get grazing animals back out into the, into the landscape again. And we, uh, uh, I, I joined uh, almost 20 years ago now and um, started working uh, in forming the um, association that I now lead called Pasture Beef and Lamb Sweden. Um, and we were formed eight years ago formally and we, we separated from WWF then. They still support us, but we are uh, independent. We are a member. Um, members organization we have about 60 members now that sounds a bit small but we're working on it uh, our mission what we want to do is to increase the acreage of well-managed uh, high natural value grasslands semi-natural grasslands and we want to do this by promoting consumption and hence production of certified pasture beef and lamb in Sweden we see this as a um, conservation action that is actually business driven. Uh, we believe that the farmers must be able to make money from producing this way, producing on this land, if they are going to see it as a viable and long term production model. So that's why we have formed a third party certification label. Uh, we don't run it ourselves. Um, we have given it over to experts. Uh, it's a company called Svenskt Seal, or the Swedish Seal of uh, Quality. And they certified, third party certify, lots of different types of foods. Um, and beef and milk and lamb and many other things. But we uh, cooperated with them and managed to put our criteria into this uh, the certification scheme and hence that's what we are using and and because we are a small organization i think this was the only way we could go forward really um and um we um our message to to sweden <laughs> and the world today um is that these it's you know in in the discussion around can you eat meat and still believe in the in a future we say it's not the cow it's the how if you put your animals if you rear your animals on semi natural pastures you not only 
provide the animals with a lovely environment and, and a healthy way of, of growing and living, you also preserve biodiversity. Um, one of the most species-rich biotopes in Europe um, you also create land that has resilience to climate change effects. We saw this very, very clearly during the drought we had in 2018 when the semi-natural pastures actually withstood the drought in a completely different way. We also see it when we have big rainfalls, um, when we this sort of land can take up and hold rather a lot of water. Um, and we know that this pasture production model that we promote also produces tasty, healthy and animal friendly meat. Um, so, so this is our message. And in the association, we, we work a lot with, um, with bringing out the message. Uh, we don't sell the meat. We don't do the business. We provide a platform where we support the companies and the farmers and the the, the uh, shopkeepers. Anyone who wants to to be involved in producing this is welcome. And uh, just two years ago, finally, after having struggled, as I said, for thirty years uh, in, in quite small scale, we were contacted by one of the two major supermarket chains in Sweden, Coop. They have always had an environmentally friendly um, way about them. And luckily enough, there was a woman in charge of meat business in, within Coop who contacted me and said, look, this thing about pasture beef, Anna, wouldn't that be something for us? Um, and we started working together. We provided uh, farmers contacts with farmers, we helped with the messaging, um, and we it is becoming a success. Um, and, and we're very, very pleased, because up until two years ago, our most common question was, where can we buy this meat? And we, we knew where there was a farmer here or two farmers there, but Sweden is a big country, and it was difficult to promote something that wasn't really that easy to buy. But now, you can get this in every coop shop in Sweden, but of course the volume is still very small. So we have to be patient, we have to grow slowly, but when something's good, it's worth waiting for, we think. Uh, of course, we have many challenges, and I, I guess we'll come back to these in time. And I realize I didn't time myself for us, so I hope you shout loudly if I'm gone over time. Um, but I would maybe just say, mention two uh, challenges that I feel that we're still working with. And one is the conservative and very slow to change meat producing industry. They do not like when people come up with fussy, difficult things that you can't source everywhere from any farmer in the country. So they, they, they're not happy, but they have to. <laughs> they have to bend in the end. And the second one is the farmer skepticism to having to go through the certification and labeling process. They feel that they do what they've always done, isn't that good enough? Why do they have to have uh, somebody on the farm checking things, sending in papers, you know, everything? And yeah, it's, it's difficult, but I, I think we might discuss that further on as well. Um, so, without further ado, uh, I think I will stop there and give the floor to, to the next speaker. We'll back to Russ first. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. That was really great overview to hear what you've been doing and really exciting to hear about that breakthrough with the supermarket. So next, uh, I'm going to welcome uh, Professor Arno Kraus from Germany, Lower Saxony in Germany, from the Grassland Centre in Germany, to talk about the label that he's been very involved in developing. And again, we've not actually met face to face, but started to engage uh, last year and really delighted to welcome him to join this panel and share the work he's been doing. Thank you. Over to you, Arno. Thank you very much, Ras, for um, having me here in the presentation. I'm going to talk about provided land supporting grazing using labeling in the value chain, and I'm going to talk 
to give a presentation about the project that we have conducted a couple of since a couple of years. Um, according to a poll that we did a couple of years ago, uh, we can underline the great appreci appreciation that society has for grazing. We found out that uh, for Germany, um, about 80% of our society expects that the cows have to be outside in the pasture, at least in summer, and 77% of the society cannot imagine ag an agriculture without grazing cows in the fields. So for us, it's clear that grazing determines the positive image in dairy farming, but this also radiates to other sectors in agriculture. Um, however, in reality, we can see, at least in our areas and maybe also in some other areas in uh, North Europe, a clear decline in grazing um, and a clear tendency towards um, indoor systems. So except Ireland, that is clearly devoted to, um, to grazing and uh, Sweden, where we have a compulsory compulsory grazing uh, program induced by policy. We see in Northern Ireland, England, the Netherlands, and in Denmark, that grazing declines. And um, according to this negative, from our perspective, negative forecast, we fear that if we don't do anything, our cows will be inside um, of 89% um, in the stables in 2025. And um, this scenario is something Mm, that is a negative scenario for us. So that's um, triggered us to um, start a project in 2014 that runs six years now, um, which is funded by our Ministry of Food, Agriculture and Consumer Protection. And uh, since the 1st of January 2021, we are completely self-sustainable. But in the last six years, we have set up a couple of aspects that I'm going to present. The aim is, um, like uh, Anna said, um, we can only maintain grazing if we support farmers. So um, the idea was to um, achieve a premium for farmers that in the long term um, means at least five cent plus for farmers and um, doing this on the basis of the value add chain. And I'm going to present um, the results that we have gained so far. Um, the aspects that we have addressed during the six years project are here in this overview. So one is um, a stakeholder community. We have defined criteria for the production and processing. We have also created our own legal entity. Anna mentioned they gave over uh, a label to an, to an organization. We also cannot hold uh, an, our own label or work with the industry. So we had to create a legal entity. Um, we have set up control procedures that we give over to the, um, the industry and of course, we have created and registered our label. I'm going to briefly introduce what we have done. So let's first um, talk about the multi-stakeholder community. Um, um, in Germany, and I think this also counts for some other member states in uh, Europe, the term um, pasture milk and also the products deriving from uh, pasture uh, milk um, are not defined. So um, anybody can understand or determine whatever he wants. And um, we also see that there's a big gap between what the society really wants, what they expect from grazing and what the producers can provide. So um, that's why we um, created a, a big multi-stakeholder community stemming from organizations from such as uh, the industry, farmers were there, but of course research uh, is there, the ministries are there and also NGOs such as um, environment and animal protection organizations. At the moment, uh, 36 organizations, they are part of it and they all signed a common agreement to maintain grazing. It's called our grazing charter. It's our common reference paper. And um, this uh, organization is meant to build the basic platform um, to, to hold this label as a multi-stakeholder community and to organize a kind of a contract between the producers and the society. Um, this basically was for us the major work and uh, we are still hoping to get more and more supporters in our uh, multi-stakeholder community. Um, here you see an overview of uh, some of the um, of the organizations like NABU, this is an environmental protection organization, ALA and Friesland Campina, some of the big um, processes are there, PROFI, these are uh, animal protection companies. So the major organizations are there. The next thing we did was <clears throat> to set up criteria for um, producing and processing 
what we call pasture-based um, uh, products. And um, this took us also a couple of time because it's quite a lot. Um, one of the, um, of the uh, criteria is the grazing period. We have determined that the cows must be in the pasture at least for 120 days. Of course, we expect as much as we can, but at least 120 uh, 20 days with uh, six hours at least every day. Or if you have automated milking uh, systems, then um, 720 hours in 120 days. And we expect in sector two that uh, farmers must um, have at least 2,000 square meters of grassland for each dairy cow and should um, have at least 1,000 square meters in the uh, very near um, area of the barn so that um, cows can really actively graze there and farmers of course must have sufficient grass for grazing. We expect that all uh, our farms have a free walk system in the stables. We have a ban on tie stalls so if farmers are there that still have tie stalls they must um, have an increased grazing period for it uh, at least 180 days per year and we expect from them that they release the cow uh, for uh, at least one hour every second day for about 90 times during the barn season. This will be also controlled. Um, in sector four, we expect that all farms have uh, uh, used permanent grasslands for the sequestration of uh, carbon. If this is not given, you can also use temporary grasslands, but you can only plow it uh, once in five years. And there are additional criteria for um, uh, biodiversity conservation. Uh, in sector five, we expect that um, all the forage that farmers provide, um, <clears throat> the grass, of course, but also other forage is GMO free. So these are our criteria that we have set up with our multi-stakeholder group. We also have determined, um, and also it is written in the, um, in the grazing agreement, that in the long run, the farmers must receive five cent premium <clears throat> Um, in, com in comments read with the market acceptance because we could not really determine or predict how this would evolve. <clears throat> um, as we cannot work with the industry because we are an organization for um, research and innovation, we created our own legal entity to manage the procedures and contracts with the industry. It's called Provideland. It has been introduced in 2017 and uh, it's a 100% daughter from our Center for Grassland and um, they are completely linked and we are the only share, the Center for Grassland is the only shareholder of uh, Provideland. Additionally, we have set up uh, determined um, control procedures for controls and um, we hand this over to our contractors, which are <clears throat> dairy companies or meat processors. And we make sure that the, um, the industry um, organizes these controls, we can um, expect that one control per farm costs about 300 euro per year and uh, all the dairy companies sign with our, in our contracts that they um, conduct these controls. We expect that all farms are controlled in a rhythm of three years. So once, um, for example, Amaland or another dairy company has about 500 farmers. We expect that each year about a third will be controlled so that the entire share of the farms are controlled after three years. Um, the label, this is the label that we have registered and solemnly introduced in 2017. It's um, um, yeah, word mark, it's EU wide registered and um, we are um, using this label since 2017. So the current status of Provideland is um, we have a current share of fresh milk of 56% uh, in Germany in relation to the to total pasture uh, uh, fresh milk. We have 2% um, um, of the entire fresh milk in Germany. So um, the biggest share is of course the conventional fresh milk and our share of Provideland of this fresh milk is 2%. Um, four retailers, uh, such as um, Edeka, Netto, Rewe and Lidl, are distributing Provideland um, on their different products. We have about 1,830 farmers participating in our Provideland program. 
We have um, at the moment 31 different products which are labeled uh, and comprise milk, butter, cheese, yogurt, minced meat, and also um, some meat products such as burger patties and goulash. And um, at the moment, uh, we make sure that um, the industry, the processors, pay to the farmers uh, some money. We can see that it is at the moment between 1 and 2.5 cents per liter. And this depends on the share of the milk, which is actually sold to the, to the retailers. For example, if they're um, a smaller company that only has 300 producers, um, um, manages to get all the milk sold in the supermarkets, then the premium paid to farmers is bigger as if, for example, only one third of the um, milk provided from the farmers is actually sold. But this is clear. So. But we do, uh, would um, wanted to have many farms in the program, so we asked our um, processors to accept everybody that is um, aiming to produce um, pasture milk. And at the moment, there are five processors which are contracted. We have Molkerei Ammerland, this is the third biggest uh, dairy company in Germany, Kropper, Friesland Campina, one of the big players in the world, Arla, uh, of course, and Westfleisch is a meat processor in Germany. These five are contracted at the moment. Um, so Provideland, um, I think, um, um, is... Um, Based on expert knowledge, the um, biggest value add that we have is the stakeholder community. We, we have worked for a long time together with research organizations and many other organizations to set this up. And we hope that the greater the acceptance among the consumers is, the greater also will be the effectiveness in maintaining um, grazing to put into value. And at the moment, um, we are really working on, a premium, on increasing the premium for farmers. We see a lot of pressure on the farms but farmers are also making a lot of pressure at the moment on retailers. And um, yesterday I heard um, somebody saying that our premium will now be increased also for the next month. Let's hope this. So this is what we did in the last um, six years and we are going to be completely self-sustainable now from uh, now on to hopefully for a longer time. Thank you, Russ. Thank you for having me and uh, I'm looking forward to the discussions. Thank you very much, Arno. Thanks for the overview and really great to hear about the work you've been doing. I'd like to now open up uh, to panel discussion with the three uh, speakers we've had. And I hope that all three of those have been able to give you uh, a flavour for the type of organisations that we have forming part of the Global Grass-Fed Alliance. So I know the questions are coming in thick and fast. Um, so thank you for those. Um, and I've just got a few questions to, to kick the discussion off, really. Um, and, and the first one is, what do you think is the strongest point of your labels? What's the strongest aspects of it? And Arno, perhaps I'll ask you to go first with that. Yeah. Um, in Germany, we have had a lot of initiatives before to, um, to work with the industry. We have um, an industry organization. We have different bodies to determine um, labels and, and ISO standards and so on, so they can also come from in a, from research and our other body to determine, to determine a label came from the industry. I think the biggest value add in this project is the, um, the great stakeholder community that we have great, created that comprises organizations from research, from practice, from consumer protections, from animal protections, from NGOs, environmental protection organizations. So it's a real contract between producers and the society. And we have seen that it took quite some time to arbitrate the gap between what consumers want, what research needs or wants or expects, and also what providers can produce. And it took quite a long time to get us understood, to have a, a kind of, an, yeah, of a common understanding. And um, I think that for us is the biggest value add that we have this stakeholder community. We meet twice a year. And um, we have uh, quite some trust and uh, common uh, understanding. I think this, this for us is one of the big, biggest things. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And Anna, how, how would that same question uh, be in Sweden? And perhaps linking to that, what's helped to provide you with that tipping point in recognition with the supply chains and supermarkets? 
Well, I would say that our strongest point in our label is biodiversity. And as you all, because I know that's the, a lot of interest in that in, in this group, um, know that, that the, the, the importance of biodiversity has been increasing uh, over the, the last 10 years. Um, so f for us, what differs us from other meat, because as Arno said, in Sweden, there's actually a compulsory grazing for cows, for instance, um, and a lot of the beef cows are definitely out uh, and their offspring too. But we graze a type of land that brings biodiversity and that's completely unique for us. Um, and, and that is part of what made the supermarkets interested because the supermarkets felt that um, the, uh, the uh, demand for meat was lowering. Um, we um, the, the the discussions have been very fierce in Sweden as well as in many other countries about can you really eat meat and and for the planet? I mean Greta after all is Swedish and she she plugs very hard you shouldn't eat meat, um, and uh, so they found a, a real green meat that they could. Um, bring to their consumers and that's I think is also why they're not too troubled that the, the, the growth of the label is fairly slow the volume has to increase quite slowly uh, because they they do sell it as a real premium product um, it's not that much more expensive than than uh, than uh, eco for instance uh, meat but but it it has this the difference that the edge is the biodiversity we have been we ourselves also think that it's very much effective on the climate change um, aspects of beef but i think the consumers find that too hard to understand so for them it's like gives them the ticket the green ticket to eat uh, pasture beef uh, even though they i mean they they think they shouldn't but they do so then they buy the 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 best stuff and that's what helped us well, perhaps we'll come back to the, the climate point in a little bit. I know there's been some questions on that as well. But how about you, Carrie? What was the real sort of tipping point and how did you get critical mass in the USA for your, for your movement? Well, we're still, um, we're still tackling uh, mislabeling uh, in retail. And because um, um, our labeling laws are in, and requirements in the United States for grass fed are really very lax. So we have... We're, we're going from the bottom up, um, and we're 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 saying that um, our online sales during the pandemic for farmers who are selling online have increased anywhere from 300 to 500 percent. Now retailers are slowly coming on board because the consumers are starting to ask for it because they're reading, and I think that some of the shutdowns on some of the big meat packers brought this this um, this i this this. Uh, what what is happening with with the way we meet is processed really brought it brought it to the consumer um, we are still um, fighting and I, I, I hate to use those words but we're still fighting um, mislabeling where everything is with with our, our government schemes allowing anything to be labeled grass-fed um, with only by an affidavit so um, it, it we're we're working very hard and we've been doing this for 20 years or so. So we do have some critical mass with the government and with our advocacy work. But um, when retail still goes to the, to the cheapest form of grass fed from wherever it comes from, whether it's really true, truly grass fed or not. And that's, that's the, um, that's the negative side. The positive side is that we're seeing more and more retailers starting to demand um, that there's some kind of certification, which of course helps our farmers. Um, so, um, uh, will you know the the, um, the schools the institutions um, have really helped us as well you know by by putting in the schools and the kids are taking it home and saying I want real grass fed and uh, so that that's been very helpful but again it's a as Anna said it's a it's a big ship to turn and um, when you have such lax labeling laws it's really tough when the retailers can can put any anything on the shelf that says grass fed so but we're we're positive and um we're we're trying to do the best we can under the best the, under the situation mm. well linking to that carrie um and something we've been discussing in, as an alliance 
I wonder what your thoughts were on whether the alliance should have a kind of international definition for for, for what grass fed should or could mean. And, and we've had a question in, um, I think, from Jane up in Orkney, in the northern tip of Scotland, um, asking about certain environments where there are particular practices of, of rearing animals in an indigenous way or on natural diets and how it's maybe possible or not possible to create definitions or standards that surround that on a, if we look at an international level. Well, when we started talking to other countries when, when this, this came up as to having an international standard or an international label, um, it would one of the reasons that we have issues with the way that our food is being raised now is that a group of people got together and said, this is the way things are going to be done. So everybody started following suit. So we like to keep um, basic tenets on how things are done, but not to um, say for Anna or Arna's um, organizations or even PFLA to say, this is the way we do it in America. This is the way it has to be done. So as long as the, the basic tenets are that these animals are on pasture, that they're not being fed cereal grains um, as, their, as their diet, and those kind of things, I think that we have a better chance of uh, letting people know that these are good labels that you can, you can depend on uh, rather than trying to say one size fits all, because it doesn't. Does that make sense? I think, I think that that's... Mm. I think it's more important for these farmers to be able to work within their government schemes their climates, um, then rather than for somebody from somewhere else telling them, no, this is how you have to do it, and having those labels mean something. And what is your approach in Anna, in Sweden, Anna? Are you 100% grass fed or are you making allowances for supplementing at different times? We do allow supplementing, and it it has to do with such a big part of our beef production comes from dairy herds. Uh, dairy calves and they are not impossible to to raise on 100% grass but it at times to produce good slaughter bodies because the consumer has to like what they eat um, we allow a small amount of grain um, and we have discussed this uh, Russ in the alliance and talked about having different levels and stuff and and I think climb climatic uh, differences in in the world is going to bring these sort of problems to us if we try to make one size fits everybody because it, it doesn't and and we we know that like I've said we 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 uh, are passionate about the biodiversity and we feel that the small amount of grain that we sometimes feed some animals it's okay because it brings all this goodness that we want um, so, so that's how we see it. We're, we're fairly, um, we, we're, uh, we're not lax, but we have decided to have this allowed rather than having to give individual um, leeway to certain times and certain farms. So, and are there in, in Germany? How is how is that situation for you and your label, and, and how does that perhaps link to uh, any government incentives for grazing days per year? It might be. For, for grazing farmers. Mm, Russ, to be honest, I'm not really a fan of governmental incentives because um, if, you, if, you, if you focus on governmental incentives, it means that you mainly focus on the symptoms of grazing. And um, I think um, what we should foster or what we should support is um, to have uh, to, to maintain grazing as a, as a craftsmanship. And um, um, I think there was a question from somebody here with these incentives. Um, what other incentives can build can be built into the scheme? So what we did additionally to the grazing program here, because this was one of the projects that we conducted, which became a program now, is to create farm walks, for example, or to um, set up decision support systems, so technological uh, instruments to support farmers, so help them to put the cows into the cows into pasture and to um, to get uh, money from uh, from grazing, because what farmers really need is money. They don't need incentives and so on. They just need to live from their from their um, job, and um, so um, I think that is what we did. And another thing about the standardization body, um, we see also some of these bad um, 
situations in Germany. I was approached by uh, one or two supermarkets in Germany after we have introduced the label. So we have the supermarkets, one big supermarket has also um, um, identified himself with the label and said, well, we are doing, we are now converting all our products into pasture uh, products. And after some time, they have used the same label, the same um, um, body of the milk packages, but used another label. Uh, another label that is more lean, that has uh, diluted criteria just mm -hmm. to um, lower the prices. Of course, we, we have some issues with them at the moment, and they are heavily <coughs> criticized by the NGOs. But um, um, yes and no with the flexibility on standardization. I think on the one hand side, we need a clear reference framework, um, not clear criteria, but a clear reference framework to have um, to make labels um, comparable and reproducible and understandable for the consumers. But at the, on the other side, we should not dilute criteria. That's quite important because sooner or later we will uh, lose the acceptance from the consumer. And we see in Germany, if sectors uh, such as the poultry production or pig production once lost the acceptance from the producers, then it will be extremely difficult to gain value add for this products. And this is, I think, what we should never lose. Very good point. Thank you, Arno. And we actually had a question following on from that um, about how we can change the growing consumer attitude that cows are a lead factor of climate change. What is it that we need to communicate instead? I welcome your thoughts on that. Anna, maybe you want to go first. Yeah, I, I do because we, we have, this is so hot and has been for, for many years. We need to communicate what the animals bring. Um, there is no way we can get around methane. I know that us lot who are knowledgeable in this can discuss different ways of calculating methane and comparing it to carbon dioxide, who's the real baddie and, and all this stuff. But to the ordinary consumer, forget about it. It's too technical, too difficult. So we have to trust that consumers, ordinary people still want and need to eat. They want to eat uh, and drink milk and eat meat and eat, uh, drink milk. And we need to explain to them it's not the cow, it's the how. I think it's it's that simple. Um, and do it in simple terms, in, in nice sounding, making them feel good in their tummies, not, not giving them a headache. Yeah. And Great. Sorry. Very quickly, um, the the methane thing is is a big a big subject and I'm going to give a little plug here for the the sacred cow movie and she does a really good job on the methane issue mm -hmm. and explaining how things go and the other thing that you have to understand is that it's Russ Conser said it's not the cow it's the how and I think Anna said that today um, let's let's not take all animals out of the permaculture which is part of the the, the whole um, world view of, of everything that's going on. Let's just change the practices as we can. But uh, again, if you want to take a, if the consumer really wants to take a really quick look at the, the methane issue, take a look at Sacred Cow. And uh, I'm, I'm plugging her movie and we're not getting anything for it, but I just wanted to make sure that it, 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 it really drilled down. We've gotten a lot of, we're, we're viewing, we're uh, showing the movie at, at the end of the month. So, but that's going to be part of our consumer education as well. Very good. Um, uh, we're running really short of time now, so I ought to probably wrap up, but we can continue this discussion uh, in the Zoom breakout room and hopefully everybody watching is able to see the link for that that will be starting shortly. Um, so I just really quickly like to say a big thank you um, to the Oxford Real Farming Conference for giving us this platform to publicly talk about some of the things we're doing around the globe. And thanks to the Pasture Fed Livestock Association in the UK for helping to host this. Thanks to our wonderful speakers who've, who've shared their work today. And thank you, you the audience, for um, following with interest what we've been doing. So we'll be popping over to Zoom shortly and look forward to seeing plenty of you there. Um, we will try and mention some contact details and there's been some questions about um, technical questions around different standards in different countries and and any research that backs up some of the things we've been talking about today so do get in touch with us if you're not going to join in the zoom link or google up uh, each of the organizations and there's links on 
on the Oxford Rural Farming Conference website. So without further ado, we will end this session and see you in the Zoom. Thank you very much, everybody, for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.